Live from the European Parliament here in Strasbourg, this is Raw Politics. Thank you for joining us tonight and this is what we have coming up for you. Facing his critics, Viktor Orban defends his record under threat of major EU sanctions. Ready or not, here he comes. Wyclef Jean tells us he's not backing new copyright laws. The state we're in, a special look ahead to Jean-Claude Juncker's big speech. Barnier's Brexit boost, could a deal really be done in a matter of weeks? And the belt with politicians over a barrel at the weekend. Welcome back to Raw Politics. Now, the European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker will deliver his last State of the Union speech tomorrow, expected to feature prominently uh, European sovereignty and strengthen borders as the migration crisis continues to grab headlines. A new study today looks uh, at efforts to stem the flow of migrants and the deadly consequences. Alex Morgan and our team in the Cube in Lyon have been looking into that story. Alex. Tessa, you'll remember through the summer, we brought you the story of these ships, the NGO rescue ships, the Aquarius, the Mission Lifeline, the Open Arms and Sea Watch. These vessels which found themselves at the centre of a European political storm as the tide turned against NGO rescue ships in the Mediterranean. And the fault lines of Europe were really exposed by this. You remember... Uh, the, the right-wing uh, Italian interior minister, Matteo Salvini, uh, unilaterally declaring that Italy's ports were closed to all rescue ships. That left the Aquarius stranded at sea for roughly a week with 630 people on board after Malta also refused those migrants. And it left the European Union really scratching around for solutions. How were they going to solve this issue? Well, the backbone of Matteo Salvini's approach that he was really pushing was to increase reliance on the newly formed Libyan Coast Guard. And in a headline-grabbing visit, to Tripoli, which uh, Matteo Salvini tweeted all the way through. He pledged more support. He pledged ships and political support to the authorities in Tripoli, effectively handing them total control of the new search and rescue zone, the Libyan search and rescue zone. Well, new research now has analysed the impact of that shift in European policy away from NGO rescue ships. Um, there was a period actually through from late June through July when it was effectively impossible for many to operate due to this difficult climate. Well, this new research looks at the impact of the shift in policy and this reliance on the Libyan Coast Guard. Let's just bring you up some of their key findings. And I think the first is uh, this one. Let's just show you here. These are the figures using uh, UN figures to reach this conclusion, uh, showing you that uh, in April, 20 people reported dead or missing in the Mediterranean. 11 in May. But look at this in June. That number rose to 451. This at a time when that shift in policy happened. You can see here the research is clearly attributing this spike in drownings. And they say this was at a time when departures were comparatively low. So what happened here was departures were low, but the risk shot right up. Then what about the Libyan Coast Guard and the reliance on the Libyans? Well, uh, this research seems to question uh, Europe's uh, seeming total reliance now on the Libyan Coast Guard. Look at this map here. This shows you a number of shipwrecks that took place during that period when there was effectively a clampdown on NGO rescue ships. Look at these. These are deadly shipwrecks, all occurring within 50 nautical miles of the Libyan coast. Now, the researchers claim that the Libyans are overstretched, under-resourced and unable to deal with this uh, situation purely on their own. They also question this European approach of externalising the problem so that Libya, effectively, is the one dealing with it. They say this has led to uh, a real increase in emphasis on the Libyans, but also the migrants trapped here. The Europe isn't thinking through the consequences of leaving these people there, saying that Europe is mostly focused on stopping people crossing regardless of the human cost. Now, there's a full article breaking this down. The research was given to us here at Euronews uh, ahead of anyone else. So you've got a full breakdown here on Euronews.com. But no doubt, Tessa, as you were saying, migration is going to be a very big and difficult theme for Jean-Claude Juncker to address in his State of the Union tomorrow. Indeed. Thank you for that, uh, Alex. And as we mentioned already, Jean-Claude Juncker has a big speech tomorrow, his last State of the Union address. And ahead of that, well, we have something to share. We have this excerpt. It's high time to act and manage the refugee crisis. There has been a lot of finger pointing in the past weeks. And also member states have accused each other of not doing enough or of doing the wrong thing. And more often than not, fingers have been pointed from national capitals towards Brussels. 
All right, those uh, two quotes from Jean-Claude Juncker. Well, I don't blame you for thinking that that's a scoop of Juncker's speech tomorrow. It certainly sounds like it could be, right? But actually, it's from his first State of the Union speech. That's back in 2014. So what does that say about his legacy and what to expect tomorrow? Well, I'm joined by our panelists, our political editor, Darren McCaffrey, and uh, Greek MEP Eva Kaili. You're from the Alliance of the Socialists and Democrats. Now, I'll start with you. You remember the 2014 uh, State of the Nation, uh, State of the EU speech of Juncker. Did anything change or you expect anything much to have changed? Well, things have changed. We have progressed a bit. We're trying to create a stronger European Union and uh, face the common threats that we have. Uh, so I believe that this year is going to be even more ambitious for the next year. So uh, having a common response to, to threats, but also to control our external borders, I think it's really essential since we were left alone. And being uh, left alone led us to have this um, not natural coalitions of the radical right and radical ref left, both in Italy, also in Greece. So I think this was the result of Europe not acting very fast and outsourcing the solutions to our neighbors. So I do believe that uh, having a better strategy, a better plan uh, will help us uh, in the future because this is a problem that it's here to stay. Migration is here to stay for decades. All right, uh, Darren, what are you watching? Yeah, I think that's undoubtedly true that, of course, migration is going to be one of the biggest issues that the European Union is going to have to struggle with uh, for the next you know, beyond the next couple of years, for the next couple of uh, decades, as Eva was suggesting. And the problem is they still haven't really uh, got to grips with, you know, the burden of trying to share this out. Clearly, mm. uh, there are countries that are on the front line of this in some in, in some senses, and others that are very unwilling to share the, the burden. We heard from Viktor Orban uh, on this show earlier on today, speaking in Parliament, saying that, you know, he does not want Hungary to become a country of migrants. He doesn't want Europe to become a continent of migrants. But it's clear that Europe cannot stop large swathes of people coming. So how does it deal with it? Well, there are suggestions in this speech tomorrow from Jean-Claude Juncker uh, that he's going to talk about some type of kind of European uh, coast guard and border force to try and deal with this. Now, that may seem like a sensible, practical way um, of sharing that burden, actually, trying to say to countries like Greece and Spain and Italy that Europe is willing to pump money into this. But there are also questions about whether it is, again, intervening into national sovereignty. Because exactly. this is a new it confidence is, for Europe. I think European sovereignty is at the heart of it. Again, in that 2014 uh, speech that he made, he was talking about finger-pointing to Brussels. This hasn't changed, has it? Well, actually, we have different voices in the European Parliament and the European Council. So I wouldn't say we have the same perspective. So when you say Brussels, we have to make sure we Absolutely. understand what we're talking about. So the Parliament was very supportive of creating legal pathways and finding solutions and strategies to control borders, but also to have the infrastructure and share the responsibility. The Council, uh, not really. And it's really important to notice that the, the countries at the borders, they faced huge political problems and all so that the countries of Visegrad, they took advantage of that and they increased populism and populistic voices there. I, I think that's an important point to point out for people who don't, you know, come to Strasbourg or to Brussels, that when you say Brussels, what does that mean? There's a European Commission, the European Parliament, sometimes they, they butt heads yeah, and, I think, and the European and, and, Council. And, 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 and part, of, part of the problem is that, of course, you know, Jean-Claude Juncker is one of four presidents. Sure. Um, and, you know, when I hear this kind of uh, State of the Union dress tomorrow, I think someone said it's not like uh, the State of the Union dress in America because it has got some vision and it's not like the Queen's speech because it's not with the Queen. <laughs> it essentially, it is with the president of the EU Commission who, in reality, he doesn't have that much power. Um, so his vision, his talk about Europe, and, you know, four years ago, he talked about Europe being broken. Uh, many people would say with the migration crisis, the rise of populism and Brexit, uh, Europe's probably more broken than ever before. And that is a real challenge to Juncker's uh, legacy. But we have to accept Speaking he has that, got limitations to his power. Oh, I would basically <laughs> say that this is not exactly the case. We are trying to do many things that we didn't do years ago. So we're trying to do many things together now. So being ambitious and having a strategy, this is really important. So maybe it's not going to happen immediately, but at least now we have a strategy that's going to be heard, and especially All tomorrow. Right. But, but there are many people <laughs> who are doing the opposite. We will have. I agree. <laughs> Interesting I agree. debate. Okay, just one word each. Legacy of Jean-Claude Juncker. Eva? Well, I think it's the investment plan, strategy okay. investment plan, creating investments in Europe for uh, I can't see how word. this could be judged One as word. a success. Uh, All not right. a success. <laughs> All right. We'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Well, Jean-Claude Juncker's final State of the Union is the most hotly anticipated moment of this week's Strasbourg session. So tune in to our special coverage tomorrow morning from 8.45 a.m.